Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Eric Hughes and I'm the product manager for Osteogenics. Before we get started, let me address how we will be interacting today. From a technical perspective, we can't hear or see you, but we would love to hear from you and be able to answer any questions that you may have. There's a Q&A button on the right hand side of your screen where you can type your questions at any time and we will try to get to them and get them answered during the webinar. Now to introduce our presenter, Dr. Sergio Garcia Moreno. Dr. Garcia Moreno received his bachelor's in dentistry from the University of Rey Juan Carlos. He received his master's in oral surgery and implantology at Hospital de la Paloma. He is a collaborative instructor for master's programs at the University de la Salle and UPC. Dr. Garcia Moreno lectures at multiple national and international conferences on bone regeneration, and he's authored articles in both national and international journals. He maintains a private practice in Madrid, which specializes in implantology and prosthodontics. Dr. Garcia Moreno, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, thanks to Osteogenic for the invitation to be here today, talking about such an interesting topic as guided bone regeneration. Um, today, inside this huge topic that is guided bone regeneration, we are going to talk about the importance of graph stability inside guided bone regeneration. And uh, let me see. Now, uh, and as you all know, uh, for sure, graph stability is one of the key factors in order to have predictable results and success in GBR. And the reason why it's so important graph stability is that because we have to know that if we don't have enough graph stability in our grafted area during the healing time, there are going to be some micro movements inside our grafted area, and these micro movements will have an effect on the cellular differentiation of the mesenchymal cells that are inside of this grafted area. And these, cell and these mesenchymal cells, instead of differentiate into osteoblasts, they are going to differentiate into fibroblasts. So at the, at the end of the day, at our reentry, what we are going to find is that instead of having a very nice bone formation, we are going to have some degree of encapsulation of our biomaterial in soft tissue. And also another big problem that we can have when we don't have enough uh, graft stability in our grafted area during healing is that the final morphology of our crest is going to be affected. We have to, to always consider that our objective and our goal when we are building up and generating bone in our GVR procedures is to create rectangular shape crests. This is our objective always when we are doing GVR. And if we don't have enough uh, graph stability, uh, what we are going to find is that uh, that lack of graph stability is going to cause a migration from the crystal part to a more apical part. And at the end of the day, at our reentry, when we place our implants, we are going to have still a lack of bone width in the most important part that is the most crystal part of this bone of the patient. And we know that there are a lot of factors or several factors that are related with this graph stability. First, for sure, uh, what one big factor that is related with this graph stability is what are we doing with our hands? Uh, I mean, like what protocols do we follow during our surgery to ensure the graph stability at the starting point? But we must know that there are also other factors that are going to have a big impact during the healing of this grafted area, like the biological factors and the mechanical factors during all this time. But first, at the beginning of this lecture, we are going to focus on these surgical factors. What can we do with our hands? What can we do during our surgery in order to boost our result and to have a better outcome of our GBRs? And first of all, I think it's important to highlight that, of course, we are not going to treat all the defects in the same way. Sometimes we are facing defects like this one that has a very good bony housing, a very nice bony walls. Um, and in this type of cases with such a good morphology, we can just place our graph in our defect and the stability of this graph is going to be ensured just by the a, a, the retention that is given by the surrounding bony walls. So all that we have to do in these scenarios is to cover with our collagen membrane and we are just protecting and doing this barrier effect to, to promote a cell exclusion, but we are not trying to ensure the graph stability with this membrane. But 
A lot of other times we are facing defects like this one in which the bony housing is not so good. Now the, the bony walls are not so retentive. The morphology is not so positive. And if we try to follow this same protocol in this type of cases, what we are going to find is that the results that we are going to achieve are going to be for sure very, very poor. So one first step that we can do in order to try to a, a improve the graph stability in this type of scenarios is to try to use the membrane that we are using in, in our GVR protocols as a way to stabilize perfectly our graft. This is what we do when we are following the famous technique from Isvan Urban introduced in 2011 in this paper. And basically what we are doing is that we are using uh, flexible collagen membranes that we are going to stretch. And in this way, by stretching those membranes, we are generating some tension and this tension is going to stabilize perfectly our graph in, our, in the morphology that we want to build up for our crest. And by following this protocol, we can see that we were able to have a very nice bone gain here in this area. We were able even to go outside of the bony housing of this patient. And we have nowadays evidence and studies that uh, state that if we compare to do in horizontal defect, a conventional GVR approach, that is this approach that we have seen in this slide with doing a sausage technique, we know that we are going to gain more bone while, when we are using sources technique because of this improve of the stability that the stretching of the membrane cause. But even though sources technique is a very nice technique and help us to have very good result in a lot of horizontal defect cases, I really think that it's not a technique that we should use in all the horizontal defects that goes into our office. And I want to show you this case to try to show you better why I think it's not a technique for all, all the horizontal defects that we can treat. Here we are seeing a case of uh, horizontal defect in posterior mandible. Um, in this case, we have a long defect and a defect with a very poor bony housing, something very common in thin mandibles in posterior, uh, in posterior mandible. And in this scenario, what we decide to do is to follow this same approach, to, to do a sausage technique. We follow exactly the same protocol as Isvanova proposed. Uh, we do our cortical perforation. We place a mixture of xenograph and autograph 50-50. We stretch our membrane. We stabilize everything perfectly. We do our soft tissue management in order to have a tension-free closure of our gun. Everything heals perfectly. And we can see here, six months later, after a no problem healing, we can see that the final result, the final outcome, of course, is better than the initial baseline point, but still, this is a complete failure. We have gone from a six millimeter vocal descent to maybe one millimeter and a half vocal descent, but we have to be honest with ourselves, and we know that in the modern implantology, to have this kind of results after an horizontal GBR, this is a complete failure. We have nowadays enough evidence to claim and to state that if an implant doesn't start in a bone, bony scenario and a surrounding bone around those implants that is not completely covering the treated surface of this implant, we know that that implant is gonna have a lot higher chances of developing preimplantitis and also to develop aesthetic issues during all the life of that implant. So. We have to be honest, we have improved the initial situation, but this is a complete failure. And in my opinion, the failure of this case was not caused because the technique or how I did the, the, the technique or how the patient, uh, what the patient did during the healing of this procedure. I really think that the problem here was this, the, the selection of this technique to do a associate technique. Because we have to think that uh, even though a collagen membrane is going to do a barrier effect that is going to last for around three months, four months, depending on the membrane that we are using, uh, the properties of that collagen membrane to be an stabilizer for our bone graft are going to be lost a lot sooner because as soon as the degradation 
of the membrane starts by the enzymatic action of the cells of the patient, this stability is going to be compromised. And if we are treating defects like this one, that is a long defect and also a defect with a poor bony housing, we have two situations that are going to cause that the um, the difficulties to ensure perfectly the graph stability are going to be much higher. So that's why I really think that when we are facing defects like this one, long defects and defects with poor pony housing, we should help ourselves by using non-resolvable elements that are going to help us to maintain that graph stability and to ensure that graph stability during all the healing time. We could have a lot of options. We can use bone laminas. We can use PTFE membranes, TMS, screws, plates, a lot of options. And we are going to see now how by using these elements, how much can we improve our results in all our horizontal GBR approaches. So first of all, we are going to start by showing a case in which we use a bone lamina combined with a GBR approach. Once again, we have a similar case than like than the previous one. We have a, a thin mandible with a poor bony housing and a posterior and a posterior mandible long defect. And once again, in this case, what we decide to do is to harvest the bone block from the posterior part of the mandible of the patient for the external oblique line. We uh, we split that bone and we use one of the laminas to be able to build up that morphology and to use that lamina as a way to stabilize perfectly our graft during all the healing time. We are using a bone lamina, an antogenous bone lamina, but we are not doing Curie technique. I really think that in this type of scenarios works better to follow a GVR approach. And I think that it's gonna help to ensure better that the bone gain that we achieve in these cases is gonna be more stable if we include some scenograph inside this grafted area. So that was what we did here. We place a mixture of scenograph and autograph and we cover everything with a collagen membrane here. And we can see like six months later, the difference in between what we had in the social technique and what we have now. Now we don't have any more a pyramidal shape crest. We have a perfectly rectangular shape with very little amount of remodeling uh, and the final morphology of the crest that we are building up is almost the same as the one that we were intending. And we can see that in the crestal part is the part that we have the bigger amount of width in this crest that is where we needed the most around the correction of the implants. So now we are giving to those implants the best bone environment in order to try to protect those implants for developing pre-implantitis in the future. One other option that we can have is to use in these horizontal defects, PTFE membranes. For me, PTFE membranes are not just an option that we can use uh, for vertical defects. I also use it a lot in horizontal defects, but I just use them in defects like this one. Defects like, that are really, really, really challenging. Here we can see a very nice case. We have a very thin mandible in this patient. And once again, as the previous cases, a horizontal defects in posterior mandible. And we can see that the posterior zone of this patient is a complete knife edge on the on all the extension. And also it's very thin in the anterior part. The body housing in this case is horrible. And we can see how the roots of the kinase have a big uh, the essence on the buccal part due to, due to that bony housing. And something that really concerns us in this case is that the at horizontal atrophy is so big that we have a fusion in between the buccal plate and the lingual plate. So that makes that the medullary space that we have here to produce bone and to, to help to have that angiogenesis and that osteogenesis in this place is very poor. So the biological power here, we know for sure that it's going to be very poor. So what we decide to do here is to use these PTFE membranes. And when, I'm, um, when I have this type of cases in which uh, we have two very similar defects uh, in both sides of a same patient, I always like to compare different things in order to see by my own experience uh, the difference that I can find. And here we are comparing a conventional, uh, 
let me see here. Hey, a conventional cytoplasm membrane, a non-perforated PTFE membrane, and an RPM membrane, a perforated PTFE membrane. And when I was studying this case, I was thinking, okay, for me, this is the best scenario we can in which we can use this RPM membrane. As we all know, RPM membranes are these new, brand new membranes introduced by Isvan Urban recently, in which what the thing that is changing the most in these new membranes is that now we have some little perforation on that membrane and the purpose of those perforation is to allow the periosteum to help to mature and to promote the angiogenesis also from the periosteum. So I thought, okay, we have a very poor biological power here in these defects. I really think that our RPM membrane should work better here is stabilizing the, the defect in the same way as the non-resolvable membrane, the non-perforated one. But here it's allowing the periosteum to do the maturation effect that we can expect from the periosteum if we manage in a proper way. And as I was very confident about my thoughts, I even I thought I have to push this difference even harder. And you can see that we are using the same membrane in both sides. I mean, the same extension of membrane. But in here, we shifted the position. Here we have the fourth extension of the membrane in anterior posterior extension. And here we have the fourth extension in buccolingual extension. So we are uh, attempting to gain more bone in the right side than the left side. And see how we are building up this crest, of course, completely outside the bony housing of this patient. And when I have to build up bone outside the bony housing of a patient, I really think that this is the technique this, that is gonna be more predictable for sure. We are doing a mixture of xenograph and autograph here. And you can see once again, how we are going outside the bony housing of the patient here and here. And for me, this is something very important. We are always following the principles of GVR and we never leave this graph uncovered. So we are gonna place collagen membranes in both sides in order to perfectly protect both sides and to ensure that cell exclusion at the, and that barrier effect on both of the sides of the patient. So we can see here now from an occlusal view, we do our soft tissue management and seven months later, we go to our re-entry surgery. And we can see that at the re-entry, the result was very, very nice in both sides. We have a 100% bone gain in bone in both sides. Of course, the bone gain in the right side is bigger than in the left side because we attempted to gain more bone. But in percentage, it's the same amount of bone formation. You can see here that there is no ingrowth of connective tissue under this membrane. There is no uh, ingrowth of a uh, pseudoperiosteum here. So we have 100% of bone gain and we have a complete success in both sides. We can see the right side here and the left side here. And we remove the PTFE membranes. We have two very nice bone formation on both sides. Of course, the right side is bigger than the left side just because of the position of the membrane. And now it's time to place the implants. And I began at the first place with the right side. And I place my three implants and I'm not doing a biopsy. I cannot tell you about how there was the degree of uh, maturation in an histology, but I'm just going to share my surgical feelings at that point. So I placed my implants in the right side and the surgical feelings were very, very nice. All the implants were very stable. All the implants were over 30 newtons. And also we could see that when we are drilling and creating the osteotomies to place our implants, there is no spreading of the bone. That is something that very common that we find when we have immature bone formation. So the, the surgical feelings, right side, amazing. Everything went very fine. But in the left side, in the non-perforated side, in the titoplast side, we can see that the volume was very nice and everything seems perfectly. But when we begin to place our implants here, we place the implant here in, in the anterior part and the posterior part that are the places that are closer to the surrounding bony walls. And that's the only part in which we have a bigger amount of maturation. But in the mid part of this regenerated area, you can see that the degree of maturation is very, very, very poor. 
the debris materialization was so poor that it was completely impossible to stabilize the, some the, some implants in the in that area. Of course, when I find this type of a scenario, when I remove a PTFE membrane, I don't go like this. Okay, I don't destroy my crest my crest so much. But in this case, I really wanted to feel that bone to see what was the degree of maturation in all the extension of the grafted area. Normally, what we do is just we remove the PTFE membrane and we just place the periosteum over our grafted area, and three months later we can place perfectly our implants. But in this case, as I told you, I wanted to push the 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 situation and to see what I, I was feeling. And you can see here how nice are the osteotomies, not only in the anterior and posterior, but also the mid part, no spreading of the bone. So uh, I protected this right side with some xenograph and some collagen membrane. And finally, of course, these two photos are not at the same time, okay? This is three months later after the surgery, and this is six months later after, after the surgery. But with both of the protocols, we were able to have a very nice bone formation and to build up a crest completely outside of the bony housing of the patient. But here we have to take more time because of the lower amount of bone formation and maturation of the bone. And that this makes complete sense because once again, as I was mentioning before, here, we are not allowing the periosteum to promote the angiogenesis from outside and to be able to mature this grafted area. So we are only relying and we are only promoting that angiogenesis and that osteogenesis from the endosteum, from the medullar space. So as the medullar space was so poor, there were very little chances to have a very nice maturation at the end of the day. And the speed of bone formation was very poor, much slower than in the right side that the bone formation, as we can see, was much faster. This is just one case. I'm just sharing with you my own experience. This is not a study, but just to show the difference that I normally find in between these two approaches, especially in these type of cases that I think that are the ones that fit the best for the use of our RPM membrane. So Moving on, we have more options. We can also use TMS to use as, as a non-resolvable stabilizer of our grafted area. And if we go to the literature, uh, we can find this uh, systematic review and meta-analysis on the topic of horizontal guided bone regeneration. And when they analyze all the literature on the topic of horizontal guided bone re or horizontal regeneration or guided bone regeneration, the group in which they were able to find bigger amounts of bone gain was the one in which they were combining the use of GVR approach and the use of TMS. So this is what we did also in this case. Once again, we are showing a, we are a case similar to the previous one, posterior, mandible, long defect, full bony housing. Look at this fenestration of this root here. And this time, what we are going to use now is a, a TMS. And just uh, one tip to do the approach of these cases. Uh, I really think that it's a great help to, before doing a surgery with a TMS, to print a biomodel of the mandible or the maxilla of the patient and to take our TMS, cut it, adapt it, and to see how it fits with the anatomy of the defect and the patient. And when we have done all this work, we can clean our TMS, we can sterilize it, and we can move on to the surgery. And by doing this, we are making everything much more easy. To stabilize this TMS in this same position as we have planned, it takes no more than two minutes if we do this previous study. So see that how the position of two TMS is exactly the same position and we are creating exactly the same amount of volume on grafted area that we were intending. So we generated the space and we are going to fill this space now with 100% xenograft. We cover with a collagen membrane here and once again, look the difference. No pyramidal shape crest at the end of the day. 
we have a perfect rectangular shape crest in which we can see the angle in between the buccal part and the crystal part. And we have the bigger amount of bone gain around the connection of our implant in the most crystal part of the uh, crest of this patient. And we have built up the same crest that we were intending to give to this patient. Once again, from the crystal part, look, not just covering the implant, we are generating and creating a thick, a, a, a wide buccal wall in the buccal part of this implant to protect and to give a better uh, bony contour for this implant. And after we move the TMS, that angle and that big width in the crystal part. And before moving on to the next part, I, I want to make this uh, clear. I, I don't want you to, to take me wrong because all the cases that I have shown you uh, uh, here, uh, talking about the graph stability, were only cases of posterior mandible. Um, I don't want you to think that the most challenging part of the anatomy of a patient to stabilize a graph is the posterior mandible because the most challenging part to be able to stabilize a graph perfectly during all the healing time, it's actually the anterior maxilla and the anterior mandible. And that's why, the reason why is because in here, in the anterior part and the, uh, in the anterior maxilla and the anterior mandible, we have the greater muscular tension and it's going to be much more tension during all the graph test time. And just to, to show you uh, how this happened, I want to share with you this case. Here we're presenting a case of a, an anterior atrophy, horizontal atrophy, in which we did a sausage technique, very tight um, membrane, everything in the perfect position. And if you see the re-entry six months later, you will think, oh, Sergio, this seems really, really nice. You have a very nice bone gain around your implant and your implant is in the perfect bony contour. But if we see this same case from a frontal view, we can see that once again, the situation changed and we have once again a pyramidal shaped crest. This was not the crest that we were intending to build up for our patient. And we have a migration of the biomaterial from the more cre most crystal part to an uh, apical position. So look how we had to to place our implant so deep in, try to, in trying to compensate this atrophy that we have in the most crystal position. Of course, we do some additional managing here with some soft tissue and some provisional managing also, and we were able to have a nice result, but this was not the, in the, the crest that we were intending to give to our patient. So that's the reason why nowadays when I am managing cases like the one that I presented before, I would like to, I will choose another protocol here. And now we have another big horizontal atrophy in anterior maxilla. We raise our flap and we are going to see now how I'm changing my protocol nowadays. And I want to have better result, but I don't want to increase the morbidity of my act. So what I like to do in this type of cases, if I'm managing a defect on the anterior maxilla, is to harvest a bone lamina, not from the sternal oblique line. We can harvest also from the lateral wall of the sinus of our patient as the same way as we are doing when we are doing a sinus lift. So this is what we did here. We harvest this bone lamina and look how we place that bone lamina in the most crystal position to perfectly hold the graft material in the perfect position and to build up the crest in the most perfect way. And from that point, we are going to do exactly the same that we saw before. We are going to do a sausage technique at the same way as Isvan Urban does, but we have this bone lamina to hold in the perfect position during all the, uh, the healing time, the graph in the proper position to, to resist that muscular tension. And here we, we mix some allograph with some xenograph to avoid to graph some autogenous bone. And we use a, a set matrix membrane here. And well, uh, just to show you one quick tip here, um, a lot of times when we are doing sources technique, uh, we have to uh, fix our membrane with pins, and we all know that 
this can be something a bit uncomfortable with, for our patient. So a very nice help that I use in my daily practice is to combine the use of these collagen membranes, in this case, a, a set matrix membrane, with the prophecy screws. We, I, I love prophecy screws for, for PTFE membranes, for, for fixing PTFE membranes, but it's also a great help um, to fix collagen membranes in a more comfortable way for our patient. The only thing that we have to do is to stretch that membrane in order to avoid any problem while we are placing our prophecy screw. And you can see how we are stretching that membrane and the membrane is perfectly stretched in all this tension, but we have a better morphology now and a bit greater protection for all the healing time thanks to this bone lamina. Well, as we mentioned before, there's not only the surgical factors, there are, are going to be also other factors that are going to be related with that grab stability during all the healing time, like the biological factors and the uh, mechanical factors, muscular tension, mastic masticatory forces, but also one other very important tension that is going to be applied over our grafted area if we are not managing the case in the proper way, that is the provisional, the, the provisional making some impact our, 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 for our grafted area. So when we're talking about provisionalization, I really think that we should uh, create two big groups. The, the, the regeneration in, in one single tooth defect or just a few teeth defect in which to provisionalize this patient in a proper way with no compromise of the stability of, of the stability of the graft by the provisional is very, very easy. We can have a lot of options and the option that we are gonna choose is gonna be uh, selected according of uh, the preference of the patient and maybe the preference of the clinician, but everything works very fine and it's very, very easy. But the problem uh, arises when we are talking about a fully edentulous patient in which we have to do massive GVR because they have very atrophic maxilla or very atrophic mandibles. And normally when I uh, hear about this topic in provisionalization in fully dentulous patient and doing GVR in this same patient due, due to this atrophy, what I'm usually hear to, to the clinicians or, or the people that is doing the lecture in whatever format or whatever study is that the most common ways to provisionalize this patient in this type of scenarios is to give them two options. Per option, nothing. To don't provisionalize the patient at all and to leave the patient without any provisional during all the healing time. Or second option, uh, to give the patient a denture, but a denture that they will try to give the patient the denture as late as possible or to try to convince the patient to use it just a little bit of time or maybe to do some changes on the on the morphology of that denture to try to avoid any 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 impact on the grafted area for me all these options are awful actually and i really think that from the patient perspective uh, are very bad option because the quality of life of the patient during the treatment time is going to be very poor uh, not uh, if, if we are giving them a denture but also if we are of course if we are giving just a, a nothing at all but also it's a very poor option talking also from the perspective of the stability of the graft because if we are delivering a patient a denture, a MUCA supported a provisional, we know for sure that even though they use it just a little bit of time or they use it just a few months later, the stability of the graph is going to be compromised. But even more, if the patient has no provisional at all, the stability of the graph is going to be compromised either because we have to think that maybe the patient at the beginning of the treatment is going to have just a liquid diet, but for sure a patient cannot be with a liquid diet for seven months, eight months, nine months. When that patient feels that he feels more comfortable and that he has no pain uh, at all in that because everything is perfectly healed, he's going to be keen for sure to eat 
soft things, maybe some breath or whatever. And by chewing this type of soft uh, food, they are going to compromise also the, the stability of the grafted area, especially when we are talking of, of very severe atrophies and very big GVR. So this is the reason why I always prefer to give to my patient an other alternative that is it will always be a fixed provisional for our patient. And we are going to explore now different type of option that we could give to our patient in order to avoid provisionalizing our patient with the previous protocol and to try to search other type of protocols. So one first way that in which we can provisionalize patient is to try to uh, analyze better what is pre-existing in the mouth of this patient that we are going to do these massive GVRs. And sometimes we have some uh, pre-existing teeth that maybe they are so destroyed that we cannot uh, maintain it for a final uh, rehabilitation. But uh, the, the, the fact that this teeth cannot be maintained for a final rehabilitation doesn't mean that we cannot use those teeth as a provisional anchorage for a provisional prosthesis. And that was what we did in this case that we are seeing right here. Look how destroyed were these teeth at the beginning of the treatment. And we have a very big horizontal atrophy in all the maxilla of this patient. We want to extract this teeth and to do a full arch implant supported rehabilitation here. But in order to give a better provisional to our patient, we are going to reconstruct this teeth. We are going to do some endodontic treatment in this teeth and also some crown lengthening. And by this, by doing this, we are able to give this type of provisional to our patient and to have a very nice outcome at the end of the treatment and to deliver a final prosthesis with a perfect uh, bony environment around these implants and having a very good stability in the long term around these implants. We can continue analyzing what's pre-existing in our patient mouth and maybe there is no teeth that we can maintain as a provisional anchorage, but maybe there are some implants that uh, they are not good enough and we don't want to maintain those implants for the final prosthesis of the patient. But once again, we can use it we can use that we can use that implant as a provisional anchorage and we are going to see now one case to see how we manage this type of protocols here we can see that we have uh, um, uh, this uh, baseline situation of this patient that have uh, two very big vertical defects in the posterior maxilla due to a previous perimplantitis here and and there we have also a, a failed bridge in the anterior zone. So we know that we want to extract everything here. The implants are in a bad position. We, we cannot uh, maintain any of the implants. But once again, we are going to do an effort to maintain some implants in the strategic position to be able to build a, for our patient a provisional prosthesis that is going to be stabilized by, by those implants. So... We extract everything, but we leave these three implants. And here at this point, what we are doing, what we are going to do before going into the surgery is to plan perfectly the provisional from this, uh, this point. Okay, We want to do all the work of planning the provisional here. And when uh, the provisional is perfectly designed, we can move on to the surgery. This is the initial situation here. And once again, as you can see, we have very similar defects on both sides. And we are going to compare once again the use of our RPM membrane with a fetoplast membrane. And once again, we place our RPM membrane on the right side and the fetoplast membrane on the left side. We stabilize the membrane and we fix the membranes with some Profisex screws and some, some pins, building up always a rectangular shaped crest in both sides. And very important, once again, we always want to have all the grafted area perfectly covered by a membrane. So we are going to place collagen membranes in the strategic position in order to cover all the grafted area and to protect everything to have a better final outcome. We do our soft tissue management, of course, always mandatory. And we are not going to deliver the patient the provisional prosthesis at this point. Uh, I always like to 
send the patient home like this and they are away for three weeks because I want the soft tissue to heal without no, without problem and without any presence of any provisional that can disturb the healing of this uh, of this soft tissue. So the patient goes home without any provisional restoration and he has to have just a liquid diet for these three weeks. And three weeks later, when the when we remove the stitches and the uh, soft tissue are healed enough, we can place our provisional restoration. And something important to highlight is that this provisional restoration, as you can see, is doesn't have the perfect aesthetic outcome and doesn't have either um, the perfect occlusal design. All this right side here is in a in an open pipe. There is no occlusion in all the right side, and there's only occlusion in the left side because we don't want to create an overload over those implants, and we don't want to compromise the life of this provisional restoration and the life of this implant during all the healing time. So we adapt the design of these provisionals always to the situation that we are treating. We are not designing at the same way as we do when we are doing a final prosthesis for sure. And that's how we manage this case. And maybe another uh, situation that we can have at, at our office in these big uh, GVRs in the endless patient is that maybe there's nothing pre-existent that we can use. There's no teeth and no implants that can be maintained. And when, what can we do at these cases is to try to do at the same time that we are doing our GVR to place our implants to be able to deliver a, a one week later a fixed provisional overdose implant that is going to be an immediate loading provisional. So once again, we are going to see one case to see how we manage this type of of protocols and here we can see a case in in a mand in a mandible this is the baseline point in which we can see that this patient had uh this very weird teeth and and with a compromised situation here in the anterior mandible but we discussed different options with this patient and after discussing several options we decided that the best option for her was to extract everything and to do one all on four approach and as you can see here in the CBCT, when we are planning the placement of those implants for our all-on-four approach, we can see that the mandible of this patient is so thin that we know for sure that we are going to have a buccal descent over the buccal surface of the central implants. So we go with our surgery, we extract the teeth, we extract the implant, we do some bone remodeling to generate a little bit more of a space for the provisional restoration and for the final prosthesis, and we place our implants. Now, we can see here that we are placing these screws here to do this tenting, uh, tenting effect to try to protect the, the grafting material for all the muscular tension that is going to be applied for the muscles that are in the anterior zone of the chin area that are very strong muscles. And that's the reason why we are placing these tentin screws. And as you can see, we are placing, we are not uh, 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 burying the implants. We are placing here some transipitelian abutments over these four implants to connect later on the immediate loading prosthesis. We harvest some autogenous bone, we mix with some xenograft, and we do a sources technique approach to stretch the membrane and to stabilize everything perfectly. The only difference that we can see is that look how we are going all the way through the membrane and connecting through the membrane the final provisional prosthesis that we are going to deliver to to our patient. The over oh. uh, the overcorrection that we are creating here in this zone and the crucial view. Then of course always so important in GVR tension-free closure in a primary growth closure here. And we just transmit, we take some impression, digital impression, and we transfer all the info to our lab in order to be able to deliver this immediate loading prosthesis to our patient. And look, this is one week later and the, uh, the placement of the immediate loading prosthesis and look at the design of this prosthesis. We cannot wait for three weeks 
as we were doing in the previous case. We have to place the this provisional prosthesis in the first week, as we know, and look all the room that we have created to don't impair the soft tissue healing here, okay? We want to leave a lot of room here for the swelling of the soft tissue. We don't want to compromise that healing. So we leave in the design of this provisional prosthesis a lot of room to be able to have a proper soft tissue management. And this is one week later. And just to give a full picture of this case, uh, here we place some we do a vestibuloplasty and some free gingival grafts because we didn't have keratinized tissue here. And we all know that we know uh, here. We need both of them. We need a, a nice bony contour, but also a nice mucosa contour around our implant. And we were able to deliver finally this final prosthesis to this patient, having this perfect preimplantary environment on the soft tissue and the hard tissue. And finally, one last approach that we can have in these type of cases is, the, is that, okay, we are doing all that we have mentioned before. We are analyzing what's, pre, uh, what's pre-existent. We cannot use anything. We don't have enough bone to try to do an immediate loading uh, prosthesis, to place an immediate loading prosthesis on the implant that we are doing at the same time of that GVR. So other option that we can have is to do an stage approach to place in a first surgery some implants, and later on, when the implants are osteointegrated, to uncover those implants and to do the GBR with the implants uh, osteointegrated. And we, we are going to see, once again, one more case to see how I manage or what is a sample how, of how I manage these type of cases. Uh, well, here I present you a case of, of a patient that came like this to our office. Uh, you can see that the periodontal situation of this patient is awful. Uh, we have uh, periodontal defects till the apex in most of the remaining teeth. We cannot do anything ab about it, and we have to extract for sure everything in this patient. But if you see the CBCT, you can see that the anatomy of this patient we have here a very, 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 very thin maxilla. And we know for sure that when we extract this teeth, we are gonna face a very challenging case for sure. So what I decide to do at this point is to extract everything and at that same point to place some implants to try to be able to use it later on. So I just bury my implants and here is three months later, I do my, my re-entry, I, I uncover the implants and now, once again, it's time to design the provisional prosthesis. Normally, what we do is we just design the provisional prosthesis, but we don't deliver the provisional prosthesis uh, till the surgery is done. But here, uh, the patient wanted to uh, have the, the fixed denture as soon as possible. So we delivered this provisional restoration for the patient with the occlusion and aesthetic uh, uh, adaptation to try to avoid any overloading over this provision and over these implants, those implants. And uh, here we can see the CBCT prior to the surgery. And here we can see that we have a very big horizontal atrophy on the posterior maxilla, but the situation in the anterior maxilla is a complete nightmare. We have no more a knife edge maxilla. We have a paper thin maxilla. The, the, the amount of bone in the anterior maxilla is just the, 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 the width of a paper. The, we know that this is one of the most challenging situations that we can manage. So what we decided to do here was we, we remove the provisional prosthesis, we raise our flaps, and we can see how the implants that we have placed are uh, with no, and uh, uh, we had a buccal deescence, of, of course, because of the bony housing and how thin was the maxilla. And what we are going to do now is that we are going to place a thetoplast membrane on the anterior maxilla where the muscular tension is the greatest. And we are going to place in the posterior maxilla some collagen membranes that we are going to stretch to immobilize perfectly our graft. And we are going to a perforate that membrane to connect our provisional restoration through that membrane with our transepithelian abutments. Everything is perfectly stable at this point. We have a 
uh, stretch everything to have a perfect stability at the baseline point. And of course, as always, mandatory for sure, tension free closure with a primary uh, wound closure here. And, and once again, for me, it's something very important. I don't deliver the final, the provisional prosthesis at that point. I leave the patient for three weeks with no provisional restoration. And after three weeks, when I remove the, the stitches, I, I take some impression and then I adapt, in this case, the previous provisional to the volume of tissues that we have at this point. And three weeks later, we are able to place, once again, the provisional for our patient. And we can see that everything seems very nice. While it's here, while it's healing, we have a very nice bone formation on the CBCT. So we go for the re-entry surgery, we remove our provisional, and then we go with the uh, the, the the removal of the PTFE membrane, and we can see that. Those implants that we have here with a buccal deicens are fully covered by bone in both sides. We can see that they are not only covered, they are covered by a big amount of bone, a big width over a big buccal plate over those implants. And in the anterior zone, remember that we have a paper thin maxilla on all the anterior zone. And now we have one centimeter and a little bit more of bone width in which we can place the, our implant in the perfect prosthetical position and to give those implant a perfect bone environment to be able to have the, the biological protection that they need. So, well, finally, uh, I would like just to conclude repeating one more time the same message that I have been repeating during all the lecture, that primary and secondary stability of the grad are, are, are key for predictable outcome in GVR, that the use of mucosal supported prosthesis as temporary pose a significant risk for regeneration failure, and that we must ensure stability during the bone graft healing with appropriate provisionalization that does not cause any mechanical trauma uh, to the graft. So thank you all for your attention. I think that we have some remaining time for some questions, so I will be delighted to answer all the doubts that you can have. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Garcia Moreno. Uh, that was some really great information. Yeah, it's time for the Q&A portion. Um, remember, we'd love to hear any questions that you have for those of you watching, there's a Q&A button um, at the top right of your screen. So um, I wanted to get into a little bit um, on, and you, you didn't touch, you touched a little bit on this, is your graft material selection. Um, when are you using like a xenograft versus a togenous uh, or even an allograft in some of your GBR cases? Well, actually, it's something that I'm changing a lot, um, and I think that there's a lot of debate, and there's not an universal truth about this fact, and we will never know because we will never have enough evidence to to be able to to state something for sure. I think, but in my opinion, uh, when we are dealing with horizontal defects, it's a predict. Uh, sorry, Stephen, the, the echo is back. Thank you. Uh, with horizontal defects, uh, as I bit, said before, you know. uh, do you hear me, Eric? Yes, as I was saying, uh, per perfect. Uh, with horizontal defects, I really think that we can use a autogenous bone, and of course, it's going to be a very good help in the healing of our grafted area. But there are a lot of possible horizontal defects that we can treat that we can go just with a mixture of xenograph and allograph, and we will still have a very nice result. And I really think that the stability of the graph in horizontal guided bone regeneration is a bigger a key factor than the use of autogenous bone. Of course, this is very controversial, and this is just my opinion, but this is my experience. And when I'm going into vertical defects, I still think that autogenous bone is something really important, and if I'm facing and I'm treating vertical defects, especially very big vertical defects, I, I want to use as much autogenous bone as possible because I think that that's not the same scenario. That This is a complete different type of case. And But still, with very, uh, let's say, vertical defects that are 
less than three millimeters, I still think that it will be also predictable to treat just with biomaterials by mixing allograft and xenograft. Okay. What is your typical mixture when you do mix your uh, allograft and xenograft? I usually do 70-30 allograft, uh, xenograft, uh, but maybe 80, 20, you know, sometimes it's, diff it's difficult to perfectly assess what is, if it's 70 or 80. But I, I want to have more allograph and just a little amount of xenograft that is going to be the one responsible for the stability of the graph. In the last systematic review and meta-analysis in the topic of horizontal guided bone regeneration, the only no thing that we know about uh, or the only thing that they were able to state in that article was that if, when they were using xenograph, we are able to have better stable bone gains in the long term. So that's the reason why uh, I always want some xenograph on my grafted area. Okay, great. Um, we had a question about the uh, threads. How do you clean the exposed implant threads before placing your graft material in the second stage of your surgery? Uh, I, uh, I imagine, I, I guess that we, they are talking about the last case. Um, well, I don't think, I think that there's no need to clean the threads in this point. Um, and I think that the evidence of this case uh, is enough to, to, to say that I'm right. I mean, like, we know that there is no bone formation around bacteria, okay? They, 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 that's something that we all know. Sorry, Stephen, the echo is back. Okay. So uh, if we have a buccal descent at the starting point of this case, and when we do our reentry, we have a very nice bone formation, that means that that bony surface is not contaminated. Maybe we can uh, have a doubt about which is the uh, amount of big of bone implant contact that we are going to have at that buccal surface. But if I'm honest, I don't care. That that implant is stable enough. It is fully integrated, and we have a very nice bo a buccal bony wall protecting that implant. So I think that that's all we need. So so I, I will. I don't need to clean. I just want to remove the soft tissue that is covering the buccal uh, dehiscence of this implant, and I'm just placing some bone, and it works perfectly in my opinion. Okay. Do you use any PDGF or any growth factors in your grafting? Uh, uh, growth factors here in Spain are, are not um, allowed. You know, uh, there there is no chance to buy growth factors here. And about a, a PRF, um, uh, I think it's a great help. But uh, if I'm honest, uh, uh, I don't use it. Uh, maybe it has some could help on our GVRs, but still, I, I think that what they, they what give us in GVR is not enough to waste that time during the surgery. So if I have it with no effort, I will use it. But I, I really think that it, does, uh, it doesn't make such a big difference in GVR, not in other procedures, just in GVR. Okay. And a lot of the cases you were showing us side by side with the RPM on one side and the, the cytoplast mm -hmm. TI on the other side. Now that you've used those together more, when when do you, how do you decide between using an RPM in which scenario versus using the, the cytoplast dense PTFE? Well, um, in these cases, to place one or another is just to to see the difference by, by my own. But if I just have to 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 say where would you choose a cytoplasm membrane and where would you choose an RPM membrane? I think that RPM membrane and cytoplasm membrane will work very well in a lot of scenarios, okay? We can use it for, for vertical defects and we can use it for horizontal defects. The only difference that I will find in most of the cases is that if you want the RPM to work properly, you need autogenous bone and you need a very big amount of autogenous bone because what you are doing is to promote uh, these BMPs that are in the autogenous bone to have an effect on the mesenchymal cells that are in the periosteum. So if you are, try to do an, an RPM 
guided bone regeneration without a big amount of autogenous bone, I think that you are not going to have a nice result at the end of the day. So if you rather prefer to reduce the morbidity of your surgery and to use a bigger amount of biomaterials, I think you should go for cytoplasm membrane, perforated membrane, to have a, 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 a longer treatment time, but you reduce the morbidity of your treatment. But in the only situation that I think that RPM will perform better than a conventional cytoplasm membrane will be the one that I uh, mentioned before, that is this type of horizontal defects or the cases, uh, all the cases in which we have a very little medullary space where the power for, of the bone of the, of the patient to generate bone is very poor because we have a very a very little volume of, of medullary space in the patient. So in these cases, we know that the speed of bone formation is going to be very poor. So if we allow the periosteum to do that effect, we are going to have, as we saw before, a greater degree of maturation and we are going to have a bigger bone gain. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, I think that's about all the time that we have today. Um, thank you everyone for watching. We hope you enjoyed the webinar. Remember that there's going to be a feedback survey that's going to be sent out sh shortly. Um, once you complete that survey, then your CE certificate will be emailed out to you. Again, thank you, uh, Dr. Garcia Moreno. Thank you so much for your time. It's been a, a great oh, webinar, sure. very informative, and uh, I appreciate you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye.